What type of government do you live in? If you answer democracy, you're wrong. There is not a single country in the world who has a democracy as a government. In fact, there hasn't been for more than a millennia. Um, it's a question we may want to discuss. But that very question gets to the heart of what we need to discuss today. It's the political enlightenment. Now, I've discussed with you before about what people were trying to accomplish in the enlightenment. But the one thing I left out that a lot of this has to do with politics and political systems and criticizing the systems that exist and proposing new kinds of systems. I mean, people like John Locke, Voltaire, Rousseau, um, and Montesquieu. Please, by some, at some point, read the Persian Letters by Montesquieu. It is brilliant and readable. Um, kind of an anomaly among these guys. But today we're going to focus mostly on Rousseau and what his ideas were to kind of understand the type of ideas that were being put out there and how they may have been used. Um, but to start with, we need to jump back a little. Um, we need to jump back to these early kind of uh, philosophs and, and their observations and, and their discussions of trying to figure out what the answers are. And to do that, we start with two guys, John Locke and Rene Descartes, because these two guys really get to the heart of a larger debate. Descartes... Um, believed that who we are was set at birth, that man is naturally flawed, man is naturally bad, and at birth he is innately born with these ideas. Now he's not born with these ideas because of Adam and Eve in, in the Garden of Eden or anything like that, it's just what it is. John Locke took a very different tactic, and please understand these guys were operating around the same time. Obviously, the card was first. Um, in 1689, John Locke put forth a concept called tabula rasa, or the blank slate. Um, and what he believed is that man is born as a blank slate. And the things that happen to him over the course of his life actually dictate who he is or who he becomes. Now, this argument may be familiar to you. Um, the nature versus nurture argument. Nature being Descartes' concept, nurture being Locke's. I, obviously, as a teacher, would like to go with the nurture argument. Needless to say, because that means my job is more important. But, Locke takes it a little farther. If, if you understand this concept of tabula rasa, it means that there's nothing inherent about who we are. He That throws out the idea of inherent sin that directly challenges the stories of Adam and Eve, and it separates the idea of sin and crime. It's not that you're sinning when you do something wrong, it's that you're committing a political crime. Um, if there's no inherent wrong, which means that it's, what's wrong is dictated by the people who make it, not uh, some standard morality, which means morals are not standard, which means there's no actual inherent wrong. And from a biblical standpoint, if there's no inherent wrong based on, you know, the Bible, then you can throw the Bible out. Um, and it's secular knowledge non-religious knowledge that is the true source of authority that's what he says he knew it was challenging in the church he knew it and he said it anyways because that's what makes the scientific revolution different from the enlightenment these people knew they were pushing the envelope and they knew they were challenging authority which brings us to another thing John Locke said because John Locke also proposed this concept of natural rights. That all people, simply because they were born, have these innate natural rights. And those rights are life, liberty, and 
pursuit of property. I know you Jeffersonian, you Americans who read the Declaration of Independence think it's life, liberty, and happiness. It's not. Uh, Thomas Jefferson thought pursuit of property was sounded too um, greedy, but honestly, pursuit of happiness is exactly which pursuit of property is exactly what Jefferson meant when he wrote pursuit of happiness. Technically, he says life, health, liberty, and possessions, and we all do that, right? And it's the government's job to kind of make sure we get that. Well. That's the predecessor. Take that natural rights and this concept that government's job is to protect your natural rights and take it one step further. Because the guy we really need to discuss is Jean-Jacques Rousseau. He is obviously a Frenchman. John Locke was a uh, from Scotland. And Rousseau takes that concept of natural rights and that belief that all people have these innate natural rights because they are human and that the government should protect that. and. He really looks close into this one word, freedom. Not brave hearty and freedom, but freedom. Um, and he does it in Du Contract Social au Principe de Droit Politique, or what has come to be known as the social contract, right? Um, in the social contract, what he proposes is that there are actually two freedoms. One is natural freedom, the right to do anything you want. I can come up to you, I can punch you in the face, and that is my natural freedom. But you also have the natural freedom to come back and punch me in the face and beat the living heck out of me. Which you might win, actually. So, um, well, I don't want that. In fact, I don't want you to punch me in the face at all. Um, there's a second thing called civil freedom. And civil freedom is that the government will ensure people's property rights or will ensure people's certain natural rights. You don't have the freedom to do whatever you want. You have the freedom to do whatever you want unless you fringe on somebody else's kind of property or health rights. So you don't have the freedom to come up and punch me in the face. Um, without getting arrested, right? That's that's civil rights. My civil rights was infringed, and you can't infringe on my civil rights without getting arrested or whatever. Um, this is what Rousseau is laying out. Well, what he's saying is people are willing to give up their natural rights, some of their natural rights, in order to achieve civil rights. In 1862, this is the concept of the social contract, that we as people are making a contract with our government, that if you protect our property so that people don't steal it, so that people don't come up and kill us without having to suffer some penalties, then we will give up our rights to kill people and punch people and take other people's property, right? We are giving up our natural rights for the civil rights of protection and security of property and person. And that is the social contract. Society sucks, but government is necessary. Um, but here's the next level. If you're willing to give up your rights, but the government does not protect your natural rights, which means the government doesn't carry its end of the social contract. You're giving up your rights, your natural freedoms to them, but the government's not protecting your natural freedoms, your natural rights, then they have actually broken the social contract. And if all government, government is nothing more than a social contract, an agreement between the people and leadership that this will happen, then if the government breaks that social contract, the people have the right to overthrow their government. And he didn't just imply this. This wasn't a Galilean, oh, the moon is matter and matter and matter, etc., if you remember. Um, he actually says, if the government does not live up to its side of the social contract, you can overthrow them. However, put this in the bank for later. He also said, the government, in order to achieve its goals, may have to temporarily take away individual freedoms to sustain the freedom of the state and therefore the freedom of everyone. Put that in the bank, we'll come back to this. 
Now here's the thing, these are philosophical ideas, but if you're sitting in a pub, in a wine bar, in a coffee shop, where by the way, these guys are discussing these very issues, and you start hearing this concept of, if the government isn't carrying up its rights, if the government isn't protecting us, we should get rid of the government. And you're discussing it as a philosophical concept of how the overall world should work. But people who aren't steeped in that philosophy just hear that. We should overthrow the government because they're not doing what we want them to do. And people start hearing that and discussing it without the intellectual background behind it. Well, that's a whole other story. We'll get to that soon.